Hi, uh, my name is Kate, and I'm an assistant engineering intern here at NASA Goddard. I'm supporting the LCRS project. So basically, How much our astronauts are going to be able to communicate with each other and us, even if they're outside of the line of sight and outside of range, which will have an object because they're going to be on the south pole, which is oftentimes the craters. Um, so I'm working on like systems engineering, very like high level, figuring out the interfaces on how all these elements will um, communicate with each other and the navigation systems as well. It's, it's been stellar. Um, <laughs> my, uh, so I graduated with my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from UCLA. And I'm coming back for my master's in aerospace engineering, also at UCLA. So I must have liked it well enough. It'll be a one-year master's program, and I'm focusing on signals and systems. And yeah, this, this internship at NASA Goddard has been so cool, and it's definitely uh, solidified my long-time goal of working here. Hi, everyone. My name is Kiara. I am a science writing intern for the Hubble Space Telescope at NASA Goddard. So I'm Cliff 130, and I work at the Office of Communications in Building 8. Um, and the kind of work that I do is that I work with the Hubble Outreach Team in communicating three decades of science to the general public. So that means writing a lot of blog articles, writing social media posts. So the kinds of things that you see on the website, on social media, things like that, are probably some of the things that I've written as well. Um, and we're celebrating Hubble's uh, anniversary this year as well, 35th, I believe. Um, and it's been really great. My background is that I studied astrophysics and pure math in undergrad at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And this past June, I just grad graduated from my master's degree in science communication. So the way that I work is that I combine journalism and science together because I love astronomy and physics and I love telling stories to people and that's exactly what I do with Hubble. And um, for NASA Goddard, uh, it's been a really amazing experience. It's never like anything I've done before. I worked with uh, several other uh, agencies before and nothing does it like NASA Goddard does. So thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm, sorry for that. Um, I'm a physics PhD student at University of Arizona. I'm originally from the East Coast, though. And um, somewhere I'm working in the quantum engineering and sensing technology lab, specifically on the optical clock project. My lovely mentor, Holly, who's here today. Uh, so we've had the clock clocks for a bit, uh, but switching to an optical transition is better for precision and accuracy of timing, which is super important for uh, space exploration and much, much more. Um, I was at NASA Langley and NASA Glenn, but NASA Goddard has been uh, my favorite so far. So. <laughs> um, it's super exciting to see um, all the quantum and cold matter technology have a place at NASA. Um, so it's been a wonderful summer, uh, especially because of my group. Well, they're taking a picture. I know there's some people here that are going to get a picture. I'll get one, too. Also, we well, I know we have some first-time uh, retirees here. I'm just going to give you a quick second to do a little say, Stand up and say hi and introduce yourself. I know we have some questions in a row. Hi, my name is Pat Kilroy, and could we put up the first slide, please? <laughs> no, I just retired uh, two years ago, <laughs> uh, and this is my first meeting with GRAA, and I'm glad I discovered you through Larry Hillier. So thank you guys, and thank you, Tony. You're always welcome. Don't make it your last. Uh, okay. Okay, we're going to have uh, Carl introduce our speaker real quick. Anybody else? Oh, of course. Ah, that's Who's this guy? No, this guy. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm George Comar, and uh, I retired <clears throat> seven years ago, believe it or not. This is the first time I'm back. I had Stan Schneider. He's been telling me a bunch of locations, and he told me to come back. But uh, I used to run their science technology office uh, for, for NASA, and, and a lot of the instruments that we developed in the last office has been in existence for 25 years. Uh, a lot of those instruments that we started many years ago are starting to find their way into missions. And that's kind of exciting. So, but I'm glad I showed up. I recognize several faces, not everybody, but 
It's good to be here. I don't want to take too much of Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome here all, all the time. Okay. We're going to have Carl introduce our speaker. Yeah, I'll be very brief. I hope, Paige, but let me get started. Uh, so, uh, delighted to have Dr. Mackenzie uh, Mistruck here today. She's the 14th director of uh, Goddard. Uh, she started April last year. Before that, she was involved in aerospace, and she was responsible for a wide portfolio for civil space across science, weather, and earth. And she worked on some projects we've heard about it, uh, or helped me call its contribution to James Webb Space Telescope, Landsat 9, uh, Roman Space Telescope, and, the, and another one, Imaging X-ray Polar Imagery Explorer. She worked as a congressional fellow uh, 2011 to 2012. She served on uh, various boards and organizations, uh, such as SPIE, uh, which is the Society for uh, Optics and Photonics, and uh, the uh, American Astronomical Society, OAS. And she's a fellow of both of those organizations. And let me see, she, she was uh, named a, a fellow, a science fellow for the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2019. And she has a distinguished record in the fields of planetary science and infrared astronomy. Uh, science policy and advocacy, and aerospace leadership. And she also was an AmeriCorps volunteer uh, many years ago for some STEM activities, so that's an interesting part of your background. And finally, she's a bachelor's degree from Portland in Physics from Portland State University, and a PhD in Astrophysics uh, from the University of College. So please welcome, for the first time, <laughs> Dr. McKinsey Mishra. Moving forward into the future. 
And the world has kind of changed around us, right? And in the last 10, 15 years even, the aerospace um, landscape has changed. We are seeing changing uh, priorities. Uh, we're seeing some really exciting technological and computing developments. Um, but again, also we are seeing um, technologies and some capabilities that have been con continued to be developed and really in a lot of cases perfected by Goddard, but then are also really uh, widely available outside. So um, I, you know, I heard somebody earlier say, hey, you know, keep Goddard technical. Um, we are absolutely keeping Goddard technical. Um, when it comes to the agency, when it comes to Goddard Space Flight Center, we're absolutely not going to become a procurement organization where we just buy stuff or we just put together stuff that we buy. Now, partnership is going to be really important moving forward. It always has been. We always have partners, whether it's in industry, academia, or internationally. Those are going to be important even more so. And probably a lot of you know that some of our key missions at Goddard have um, survived difficult times because our partners have been able to advocate for those programs externally in a way that, that we can't. And so those partnerships are part of what will also help us get through tough budget times. Um, so there's going to be some change at Goddard. Um, we are gonna, again, we're going to stay uh, technical. We're going to stay doing hands-on work. Some of that might change. For example, we are investing a lot in quantum right now and quantum sensing, whether that's communication, um, the atomic clock work, but also we're looking at um, transition ed edge sensing detectors for astrophysics, which really beat down the shock noise for very sensitive astrophysics missions. That's a quantum sensor that we're working on. And we're also working on a cold atom uh, gravity uh, gravitometer that is um, really to, to get to basically grace and grace follow-on, but being able to do it at a much higher resolution and sensitivity and with only one spacecraft. So if we're going to invest in those kinds of technologies, we also have to be able to maybe sunset over time some other capabilities, either through tech transfer or because we uh, we have it available widely. So again, we are going to change, but that's an important evolution because we have to be pushing things forward. George, you mentioned that some of the, um, the instrumentation that ESTO has uh, invested in for a long time is just now getting to the point of being able to use in space. And we see that all the time. Right, where it takes a long time, the gestation period for some of these technologies is very long. Um, and that's why we have uh, come up with our Goddard 2040 vision. Um, and this is really about, again, thinking not where we want to be in 100 years, but really where we want to be in about 15 years. And what do we need to do to get there? Now, it doesn't mean that we are ignoring where we are now or what we need to do to keep the center strong now. But it does mean that for myself and the rest of our leadership team, I'm expecting that we're going to be spending considerable time thinking about our future. Um, this is something that, that I did at Ball Aerospace um, and, and that we had a lot of success with. Uh, when I came in, we had a, like a 10 year decline in our science business. We hadn't won anything in literally a decade that had been competed, certainly. Uh, we had had some sole source things. We had had some really challenging execution issues on cost and schedule. And when I came in and when, when we brought in uh, some other members of the team, we said, OK, we've got like, to get healthy now because we were in a bit of a death spiral where we didn't win some missions. We weren't going to be generating enough resources to be able to keep winning missions. Um, but also, we've got to think about where are we going to be in the future and what are we doing now to create that future so that we don't just end up in the same position that, we were, that we're in right now in another 10 or 15 years. So again, I'm expecting that leadership is going to be um, focusing on what we need to do now and focusing on the longer term. And I know that we can do more than one thing at once. So uh, that's really what the Goddard 2040 vision is about. And we, uh, we came up with seven strategic vectors. And um, so thinking about vectors, right, they have magnitude and they have direction. Uh, and the magnitude is time dependent often. And um, they're not always the same magnitude at the same times. So that means that there are some things we're putting a lot of effort into like right now because of the nature of timing, and some things that are not icy on the back burner, but we're still kind of thinking through, okay, how do we make progress on that? Um, and the first uh, vector is really about our interdisciplinary science. Um, and this encompasses a lot of what we do at Goddard on the science side. I think the thing that makes us, one of the things that makes us unique and that we need to get even better at is having the scientists and the engineers working side by side, working in teams and across different disciplines in order to come up with the best ideas for the next generation of mission concepts and instrument concepts and technology. 
Um, and we still have silos. I mean, any organization is going to be somewhat siloed. Uh, but we are trying to break down those silos more. And it also means that the kind of missions that we want to take on for NASA, I think, should reflect that kind of multidisciplinary science. Are we really taking, hey, you know, this is what we know on Earth science sensors. How do we really translate that into a planetary mission that would be transformative uh, for science and for the agency? Um, again, it doesn't mean that we're not going to do a small explorer that is in a, a really narrow area of science. Um, but again, this is how we're going to be thinking about the types of things that we take on. Um, it also means that uh, we want to ensure that we are bringing um, important science into the Artemis program. Um, human exploration has put a lot of emphasis uh, in their messaging about Artemis, about the, the need for science. And so we, with our expertise and with the involvement we already have in the Artemis program, and again, we're actually trying to set up sort of an Artemis Science Institute so that we can bring in um, more disciplines. But talking about, yes, lunar science, but also Earth science from the moon, astrophysics from the moon, heliophysics, what are all of the areas of science and technology development that we should be doing for Artemis? And how can God really play a role in helping to establish that? Because we have the engineers and scientists who know what's possible, who know what's important in terms of the decadal surveys on the science side. So we want to make sure that we're doing important science at the moon, not just here are a bunch of random science areas that we think we can make progress on. So I think that that, that is a key piece of this vector. And that transcends whatever Artemis is now or whatever it might be in the future. Of course, we often see that human exploration programs can evolve over time across different administrations. Um, but our commitment to really doing the right thing, developing the right science and technology doesn't change. Our second uh, vector is um, the search for habitable worlds. So this is really search for life beyond Earth. This is a major key focus of the science mission director. And since we serve the science mission director uh, for you know, most of our portfolio, we want to be involved in those most important high priority science areas. Um, so the, the, the magnitude here is very high on our first priority, which is the Habitable Worlds Observatory. So Habitable Worlds is the next generation of very large segmented optics in space. So this is, you know, post-Roman, post-JWST, what are we doing for the next flagship? And as you all know, I think a, little, a lot better than, than I do even, that those really big flagship projects, those are the things that keep Goddard really sustainable and healthy in the future. And they help us weather other kinds of, you know, uh, sometimes missions get canceled, sometimes missions get delayed. What helps us weather that is having big projects that can really keep our workforce engaged and, and help us absorb any other shock, shocks to the system. So this has been a big priority. We were successful in uh, getting the Habitable Worlds Project Office located at Goddard uh, this year, so it is official now. Um, and we have a, you know, a small ramp up of funding coming, um, but we are looking to increase that. And this is, again, you know, it's going to be done with our partners. Um, JPL will have a, a role, other NASA centers will certainly have roles for academia and for our industry partners, but this is going to be a Goddard-led um, and managed project that will definitely have hardware and key roles for our Goddard workforce. So that's been a big push, and now the push is to try to get it uh, the, the funding profile so that we can accelerate the development of that process. Um, but it also means in, in our search for life, how are we again taking our multidisciplinary expertise and the instrument expertise that we have, because frankly Goddard develops and builds the best instruments for science, how do we um, look forward to future missions, say at Enceladus, where we want to go and we want to actually try to take samples at Enceladus? How are we going to do that? Are we going to bring them back? Are we going to try to analyze them in situ? Um, to really try to get the forefront of how we do that search for habitability and maybe even inhabitants um, uh, throughout the solar system and beyond. Okay, the third science vector is um, really behaving as a hub for Earth science, system science. We already do this, right? So this isn't something that's new for us, but um, what I'm looking to do is ensuring that Goddard becomes even more of a high-profile organization for Earth science. Um, I can tell you that when I was at, at Ball, I was out sort of traveling around the world um, talking with different stakeholders about Earth information. We were looking to maybe sell Earth information or analytics at the time. And I was surprised that basically nobody knows 
that NASA does anything with Earth science or climate science, let alone God. It is not known. It's known amongst the science community, but when you go and talk to people who use that information, like people in the financial services organizations, people in insurance, reinsurance, they have no idea. They know they're using NASA data, but they somehow don't really know where it comes from, or the fact that it requires support to continue to get funding for. Um, I'll also say that you know we have the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, which kind of is a little bit on its own up in New York. We are trying to expand out the impact that that has. They're doing all this amazing work bringing the data and the modeling um, to state and local officials. And they're actually, in New York, they're making decisions about things like housing codes and building codes, um, about trans the future of transportation, how they're going to continue to maintain the subway system. They're taking that information and using it as part of, hey, what do we need to do in the future, accounting for the fact that uh, we have this sort of science data and modeling. So we're trying to bring that back. I want to bring some of that here to Maryland. I think that that would be really beneficial for our state. We're already looking at ways to do things, say, in Chesapeake Bay that are very similar to what's going on in New York waterways. So uh, again, this is about not just doing all the work at Goddard, but how do we bring together people who need the data and ensure that it's getting to them, but also how do we bring in new partners, right? How do we bring in people like um, you know, everybody you know, mentions Planet or Maxar because they're selling Earth Science data. How do we bring them in? They're going to be doing this no matter what, right? So we can kind of say, no, we don't want to work with you, but I don't think that's useful. What we are trying to do is get our folks together and say, what is a way that we can use this commercial data that acknowledges that, you know, they're not going to give us their raw data and their algorithms because that's their, you know, proprietary information, it's their business model. We can't ask them to break their business model. But how can we take it in and say, is there a way that we can um, you know, assess the data and maybe provide some amount of risk assessment? And then how do we use it accordingly in our models and data sets? How are we able to easily remove it or add it? How do we ensure that the NASA data that is free to all, how do we make sure that that has some kind of um, protection so that it can't be altered beyond you know, uh, recognition and that we can trace it back so that we can um, you know, be arbiters of, hey, this is what the scientifically, you know, scientific integrity of the data. Um, so we're, we're looking a lot at, at this issue. Um, we have always, as, as you know, um, had an important role to play in housing and distributing Goddard's, or, uh, NASA's Earth Science data. The really exciting um, is that SMD, the Science Mission Directorate, has now tasked um, uh, Goddard with uh, coming up with and executing its entire cloud-based architecture for data across all of the science mission directorate. And that doesn't mean just storing data in the cloud. It is all about how are we doing the analytics, how are we maintaining scientific integrity, how are we doing the distribution out to users. I think it's really exciting because this is putting us at the forefront of how the data gets collected and used and disseminated. So I think this is a really exciting area for um, for Goddard. Um, next, if the thing works, there we go. Um, space weather. So space weather, um, again, through some interesting reasons, has become uh, really important to um, our stakeholders, particularly members of Congress. Um, I think that the heliophysics community has done a pretty good job of going out there and saying, hey, this is important and we're not doing enough on it. Um, and that's resulted in more activity at NOAA on the operational space weather front, um, more activity in other government agencies, and, and more activity at NASA as well. So we want to uh, continue to expand the Goddard role in, yes, building and overseeing the design and build of the missions, but again, also in how we're using the, de the data and how we are bringing together um, the data and the applications from a lot of different sources. You know, NOAA is responsible for the operational um, space weather portfolio, and um, Goddard has far more heliophysicists and space weather scientists than NOAA does. We have the most in the world, in fact. Same with Earth, science, uh, Earth scientists. So we've got to play an important role there. So this is another where we are looking to expand. Now, again, budgetary uh, issues mean that this is probably not something that we have to pull the trigger on um, you know, immediately. But this is one where there is kind of this slow build, and, um, and we're, we're working on how to become a leader there. We just signed an agreement last week.
when I was in Colorado with the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, and that's in part to bring some of their resources and the resources of Colorado uh, to bear so that we can again start expanding out what we do. So now, how do we do those things? So those were our kind of four scientific vectors. Also, that is not meant to encompass, encompass everything that God does, right? We are, this isn't, you know, that, that isn't everything. That is kind of, here are areas where I think in particular, we have particular expertise and ability to have major impact on the fields, and therefore, and, and I think that, that have uh, funding opportunities as well. So those are kind of big highlight areas where we're going to be making pushes, but it doesn't encompass everything. Um, in fact, it doesn't come as a few critical science areas. I've talked to a number of you about TDRS. And um, the next generation of TDRS, we've got challenges there. Um, the, you know, the, the administration, um, OSDP, has uh, really decided for us that we're going in this commercial direction. We have to figure out how it's going to work. Um, and that is a real challenge. And so the, the follow on with TDRS is, is critical. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I didn't, it wasn't a question. Oh, okay. I was just crossing my fingers. Crossing fingers, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and then, and then also beyond, beyond teachers, um, you know, we have this excellence in PNT, communications, geodesy. We have to do that for the moon. We have to, if we're going to have real like, presence on the moon, we've got to figure all of that out. And that is, is squarely in Goddard's purview. I mean, we have been told you're going to be responsible for PNT, geodesy, communication for the moon, the lunar environment. So I'm excited about that. No, I do. So far, it hasn't quite risen to the priority level in the Artemis program for funding. Yeah. Now I do have this. Yeah. You mentioned geodesy. Uh, for the last 12 years of my career, I was on the Space Geodesy Project. And I became very, very aware of all of the, uh, I guess, spectrum being yeah. Yeah. Um, populated by um, tens of hundreds of thousands of satellites um, for commercial use. And um, we, we really have to use that tier one status that we have for geodesy as the leverage to get a seat at the table when we're talking about coordinating the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and it's spectrum and, it's, and there are other issues that are not even related to that about having those large constellations. So the answer is yes, we do need to see at the table. Um, what, you know, uh, one thing I am excited about at the headquarters level, so we have a new head of the SCAN office, Kevin Coggins, who's come in, and, um, and I think that he has, uh, I think he has a good viewpoint. I think that he brings sort of a fresh set of eyes um, and we're going to be doing a little bit of a reset. Um, also, we have, um, we've asked a, a gentleman named Johnny Pellish, who is a longtime Goddard employee, if anybody knows Johnny. He just finished um, doing details at OSTP and at the Space Council. Um, so he's had some really good policy experience. I've asked him to come in and kind of be responsible as a point person for all of our other government agency engagement. And so I think he's going to be a very strong voice because he's going to bring in kind of, he's going to represent Goddard and um, he has relationships with some of those folks. So the spectrum issue is one that we are right. concerned about. And I'll be honest, I mean, I think that our stakeholders, including even some at NASA Piper, do not understand the importance of what we do on geodesy. So it's also up to us to be um, doing that education. Well, I think a, a real ally could be the National Science Foundation uh, because of oh. the the portion that they're the they're the uh, looking up people, yeah, yeah, as opposed to us who are mostly paying it. NASA is mostly paying attention to the looking down people in, in terms of yeah, yeah. You know, like it's like that the yes, yeah, so the astronomy community has been. Uh, I come from the astronomy community, so so the answer is yes. They've also kind of been a doormat, frankly, on this issue for a while, and so. Um, but I do think it's kind of, they are getting more pragmatic about what it means to to work this issue. Ashley Vanderbilt, she 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 oh, really is yeah, no, getting things done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, so how are we getting things done uh, in terms of Goddard 2040? So we've got three 
more organizational functions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Um, again, really looking at partnerships. We already partner, but we're looking at all of our procurements and contract vehicles and really figuring out how do we do things faster? How do we make it a little easier to work with Goddard? Um, how do we make sure that our contract vehicles are working for us too, that, that we're getting what we need out of them? So that's an area that we are uh, that we're spending time on. Um, you know, having a culture of inclusion and curiosity. Uh, this one is important to me. Let's talk about the curiosity piece first. I really, really want our people to understand what's going on in the rest of the world in engineering, science, and our partners. There were a number of us who were in Colorado last week, and some of our team was extremely surprised at how advanced some of our partners have become. Um, and so we've really got to find a way to make sure that, that all of our, our, our technical folks really know what is available outside and what's going on outside, both so that we can leverage that, but also so that we can say, okay, what do we need to be doing that isn't being done in the industry? Um, so that curiosity piece is important to be curious about the world. Um, and then, of course, you know, having an inclusive environment where everybody comes to work every day and feels like they don't have a cognitive load about what people think of them and they can come and do their job. Um, and then the final is, uh, okay, so the biggest people ask me, what's the biggest surprise for you guys? Oh, that's, that's an easy question. It's the state of the facilities. Um, I have not had the full underbelly tour before and the full tour of all of the Goddard facilities. They are aging facilities. I mean, many of them, I mean, you know, Building 5, that was the fifth building built at Goddard. It's still in heavy rotation and it was built in 1965 and we, we've got a long way to go here. This is an issue at the agency level that is, I think, that is getting some traction and attention. But basically, the way that uh, our budgets and appropriations have gone, our budgets have gone up, our mission has gone up, and the relative funding of our facilities has stayed flat over the last 20 years. And so we've effectively lost a ton of buying power when it comes to facilities investments. I don't know the way out of this yet. We, this is not an easy, this is an easy question, but uh, we are looking at how we, um, you know, accelerate the, the implementation of our master plan, et cetera. So that was a, this was a little harder. Ray Rubelotti can talk a lot about that one. Uh, the next time he's here, you can say, what the heck are you guys doing? Um, of course, you know about our different facilities. Um, you know, Wallops is so important to us. And such a, I mean, it's an integral piece of Goddard. So we're trying to ensure that our other um, uh, locations, particularly Wallops and, and GIS, that they are really integrated into what we do at Goddard. But we don't want to go in and break them by making them do something that's not, uh, that isn't useful. So this is the end of the slides. I will say, um, again, happy to answer any questions uh, or, and, and listen to any comments, but I do have an ask. Um, so, okay, Reti having a retirement associate, a retiree association, an alumni association, could be incredibly powerful to the center. Right now, I said, you know, we have a serious, serious budget problem. Um, we are fighting to keep a couple of our projects alive, but honestly, the Roman Space Telescope, that's our big NASA mission. We don't have a lot in the development pipeline, and that's been because, you know, budgets have, some things have been canceled, um, and some things have had either a, a very slow start, or they've been delayed indefinitely, and all I can say is that this is, like, what I spend almost 100% of my time on. Um, you know, we, this is the, the crisis point for Goddard and our future. Um, but the fact is there's only so much that we can do. Our partners, I can tell you, are definitely engaged and they care a great deal about what happens to Goddard. The Maryland delegation, other stakeholders, they do care and we have really amped up the amount of people we're bringing in to see Goddard, to see the work that we do. We're doing a lot more external briefings and we're doing a, a lot of communication, but frankly we've got some catching up to do. Um, and so my ask is, you know, if, if we have a retiree and alumni association that included also, and again, not, not necessarily in, in almost the same cohort because the retirees have maybe different interests than maybe the former interns do, but people who are postdocs here, people who were interns, people who used to work here, work elsewhere, and are retirees, if that were a network that were really connected on social media, on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram, all of that, that would be helpful because there are messages that you all could be amplifying about the center and its importance. I'd also say that you know, for NASA, we're part of one NASA. 
you know, it's not like we do have a lot of like Goddard specific branding. And so unfortunately that means that a lot of people don't know what Goddard does. We had the Office of Management and Budget, the director of OMB, um, out a couple of weeks ago um, with a Congressman Glenn Ivey. This was at a congressman's request. They were so surprised at a lot of what they saw because they don't know that it's happening here. So my ask is uh, maybe a little bit more organization. I'm guessing that the social media might be more in the, the intern and the, the postdocs uh, wheelhouse. But I would love if we could have the group, again, I mean, you know, if there might be people who want to write op-eds, I'm not directing you to do anything, but you are highly respected people. I mean, you have done so much in this world um, that your voice carries weight. And if we had more voices out there, I think it would be beneficial. Because right now, there aren't a lot of people questioning the fact that we are really reducing NASA's science budget, and that that is going to have long-lasting impacts on our, certainly on our workforce. So that is my ask to you, that maybe a few of you can get together. But then looking at the interns here, you guys came, so now you're voluntold. That's, That's how it goes. goes. So, um, but, but really getting together with a couple of different types of communities and saying, look, we've got this organization. How can we use it to help ensure that people understand what's going on at, say, NASA Science, and particularly at Goddard, because I know you all care about that. That's why you're here. Um, and people who have worked at Goddard care a great deal about the organization. Um, so that, that, again, is my ask, and I'm hoping that we can uh, make it easier for also your organization to be understood by people who are retired. So we're going to look at that, that because I know this is an issue that's come up. How do we make sure that retired uh, uh, to make sure that retirees uh, are are getting information about getting information about um, the organization and that uh, contact contact information is available to people and that you guys have access to retirees. There's some HR things that we have to work out, um, but we do want to try to make it easier so that more of our alumni and retirees get connected um, into this really great network. So, um, so again, thank you for having me here. I'm sure there are probably some questions.
in 2025, I guess. 25, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have an opportunity to be a showcase for the nation and the world, really, if we make every effort we can to use uh, electric vehicles in, in our thinking and, uh, you know, pedestrian walkways and, and bikes and, and just do it right. And even with the potential of maybe even putting up like a mini visitor center that you could charge your car and then watch a movie about Goddard while, 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 your, car, while your car is charging, right? And, then, and direct you over to the visitor center, whatever. But, 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 but there's, there's real potential there, and we had until 2025. So when we open those gates and we have that, um, I guess, new facility, yeah. then you know, connect to the city of Greenville, connect to the Department of Interior. Because uh, the Department of Interior is all around us. There's yeah, Greenville Park, true. there's the there's, there's, uh, Patuxent Wildlife Refuge. Um, it's all around us. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. No, that's, I, I like that. Um, I'm sure that there's some appropriation thing somewhere that probably will tell us whether we can or can't do that. But no, I think it's, it, it's an interesting idea. And I will say that, um, yeah, one of the things that we are trying to do is make the, the more bikeable, more walkable, and eventually we've got to make it more friendly to mass transit so that it's easier for people to bus in. Um, we have actually been really making a lot of relationships with uh, the Lieutenant Governor, with the Department of Commerce, with the Maryland um, Economic Development Corporation, and with the City of Greenbelt and the County of Prince George's. Um, and so we are, we, we're, try, we're exploring where we can do things together. Um, it's a little bit new for us because we haven't kind of done joint projects where, and we have to, again, money is always going to be the issue. But, um, but yeah, I, I think we need to be creative. I'd be happy to be a liaison. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. I would. Yeah. I, it's, it's right in my retirement mission statement. Yeah. Excellent. Good, good, good. Thank you. <laughs> Going through the Peters era when we had commercialization, I hope someone tells Congress it didn't work. It was a terrible system. Don't try it again. You're free to tell me that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, there's a uh, there's a there's a lot. I mean, this has definitely come from uh, the administration to NASA, and there. Yeah, there are a lot of problems to work through, challenges to work through. Uh, I don't know where it's going to end up. I mean, we're going to have a new administration next year, one way or the other. And so the first thing we'll have to figure out is, are there any directives that we've been given that now a new administration is not interested in carrying out? Um, so we'll see if there's any change there. But you know, in the meantime, we're going to do our best to, to make it work. Um, but yeah, there are real challenges. I noticed that you didn't bring in artificial intelligence. Oh. And what that for those people is, my feeling is 240 is a little too far to think that, that far. Because the whole universe is moving into a different way to live. You have to yeah, I, I, yeah I, didn't, I didn't mention AI. So uh, we actually just recently hired um, a chief AI officer for Goddard. Um, and he's been, he's already, uh, I think, done two different workshops with um, people in academia and industry. He's got a whole plan of how he's in, working to implement AI into Goddard. Uh, we have a lot of people working, using AI in their research and in other areas. Um, but that it's, but we don't know kind of everywhere it's being used. So he's also just figuring out who is a community of practice. We're also um, going to be implementing it into our business practices as well. So absolutely, AI. We are we are definitely diving into using it. Of course, there are again just some challenges and things that we have to think about in terms of ethical use and um, you know a, a lot of issues. But um, but like I said, we already have people using actively using AI in their work, and so we're just trying to figure out what's the extent. Um, but I think he's he's I think he's going to do a really good job of ensuring that we're doing the right things as a center and that we're. You know that we're investing. I know that NASA is also looking at how 
how it might develop, and this is just an idea, right, about how it might develop a large language model that includes NASA data, and because all the NASA nomenclature and all the technical data is never going to make its way into, say, you know, the Google large language model. So we're trying to figure out how, does, how can we best um, take advantage of all of the data and lessons learned, everything that we have from NASA, the sort of technical archive, how do we access that in a better way? But it is, again, challenging because we can't just put that into a, a regular commercial model yet. So, so we have time. One last question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more, one more. Um, I used to find it was difficult to talk at Goddard sometime, but I visited uh, last year and this year, and it kind of seems largely empty. And so, uh, the back to work thing, how are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so we don't, so we, we, have, we have asked, and my, my desire would be that people are, you know, again, there's a, you know, a distribution, but, you know, three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, we are not necessarily seeing that. Um, you know, as you know, we, you know, there are um, labor union issues that have to be negotiated. Uh, also, the administrator, the NASA administrator, has not said that we are going to do some kind of mandate. Now, the Department of Commerce is, NOAA is, there are other agencies that are starting to do more mandates. So I don't know how that will change in the future. Um, I really love the flexibility. I think it's great that we can be flexible. And, you know, humans are very social creatures. And um, especially for our early career folks, we're hearing a lot of demand from their cohort saying, I can't even go to work at NASA. There's nobody here, and you know, and, and I'm not learning from the, the other people, right? I mean, people who are very senior in their careers who have a lot to um, to transmit and to help people learn. So uh, yes, it is not where we would like it, um, and I, I don't know when we're going to see some kind of mandate, if if ever. Um, but we are hoping that again, with the continued. Um, you know, bringing in new people, bringing in interns, we're hoping to get people energized by that and also hoping to incentivize uh, that. But yes, it's, it's not, not where we would like it yet. <laughs> You're right, it used to be you had, it was hard to park, and now it's hard to get for day. No problem. Thank you.